welcome to the seventh episode of the Nerdum and Other Nonsense Anime Podcast. Today, we're jumping into the spring 2017 season, and we'll be giving our first impressions and initial recommendations for the shows we're going to be watching. We'll also be finishing the show out with our new voting system to decide which shows we're going to cover throughout spring. My name is Beecom, and beep, beep, I'm um, sheep. I say beep, beep, I'm um, sheep. Also with me is Leo. Oh, man, I don't think I've ever consumed so much anime in, in one week's time because of this uh, spring season, man. Yeah, we watched a lot. Yeah, and also since we're doing discussions on, on individual episodes, expect heavy spoilers, everybody. I don't think I need to press on that. I think it should be obvious, but you got anything else you want to add, Become? Well, I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like I'm having a little bit of deja vu. Oh, I think that's probably because we actually did record this once, but then ran into audio problems and have to start over. <laughs> Well, it's good. It's good. Honestly, it works out better in the end because uh, we'll do a better job this time. <laughs> <sighs> so so anyways, let's get into this. Uh, how, yes. how long is this Google Doc in front of us? Let's start this 52 page Google Doc on the spring 2017's anime season. How about you start it off? All right. Starting with Sundays. And the first new show is Alice and Zoroku on Crunchyroll. Uh, the Japanese title is Alice to Zoroku. And the studio is JC Staff. Uh, director Katsushi Sakurabi from Flying Witch. And Leo, now you're typing to me that I deleted my line about your drink, but I figured since it's a new <laughs> day we're recording this, you would have a different drink. I did, and I updated it. it <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was an energy drink last time because it was so long. This time I have a screwdriver. Oh, you have a screwdriver. I thought you had a screwdriver last week. That's why I was confused. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Now we all know Leo's got his screwdriver and we're settled in. Yeah. I'm so, happy. this will make this pretty easier. Let's say. <laughs> <laughs> Episode one of Alice and Zoraku is called The Red Queen Escapes. This was a 44 minute long double episode, which opened on a dark and stormy night. And there's a little blonde haired girl in the hospital gown who was escaping from a research facility owned by the KNC Pharmaceutical Corporation. Are they any, in any way related to uh, the Umbrella Corporation? They're pharmaceutical God. also. <laughs> yes, they're clearly... <laughs> I could see her with a little umbrella. That, that would fit in her, with her whole aesthetic for sure. Oh, the crazy things this uh, pharmaceutical company is doing, they have to be like the sister corporation of umbrella that's all i'm saying <laughs> definitely that was the secret ending to resident evil 7 for sure uh <laughs> the director of the facility i think is leading a search from the control room and uh he's like bragging about how he limited the girls calories at dinner like they, they don't feed these girls a lot so she's not going to be able to get far away but she uses her powers to teleport once uh, to a different area, but they have security cameras all over the place, so they spot her almost instantly. Uh, and they send a car out with uh, somebody from the facility named Mini C, uh, and she floats out. Like once she get out, gets out of the car, she floats like towards the girl um, holding an um umbrella, and she's floating on this large like Titan hand that glides across the street towards the blonde girl. Um, and she, we find out that this little blonde girl is named the Red Queen, like from Alice in Wonderland. And she's or Resident Evil. Okay. <laughs> the yes. the uh, computer program is named the Red Queen. That's true. Yes. And I just watched the uh, final Resident Evil on a quick tangent. The final episode, and it's like, how many episodes was there? Like movie seven, something like that. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed I the whole thing, even though some of it's pretty dumb, but it's really, that's what it is. It's just dumb fun with action and all that stuff. But I will say that final movie, whew, that one was a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, heard right, that too. Keep going. Uh, so the little girl collapses because she's all out of energy. And uh, Minnie C tells her that Wonderland is the only place she belongs. So uh, more Alice in Wonderland references. So uh, another girl shows up, though, and starts fighting Minnie C. And in the middle of the fight, this girl drops the, like four jars of like orange marmalade jam on the ground for uh, the little red queen. And so she starts eating the marmalade to get her uh, energy back. And um, the girl who's fighting causes a lot of commotion. 
uh, and tells her to jump oh, and tells the Red Queen to jump away to the biggest city she can imagine. Uh, and then the girl runs from light pole to light pole, knocking out all the electricity in the area. So the surveillance cameras are all down and the Red Queen teleports away and disappears. So after that scene, we cut to this meeting at a place called Kawaki Industries, where a Yakuza boss is meeting with this old guy with white hair who we find out his name is Kashimura. Uh, we find out that Kashimura delivered something for this Yakuza guy, but refuses to receive like any gifts or anything other than just his initial fees, just like a very old school dude. And after he leaves, he goes to this convenience store where he is a regular there, and the clerk tells him that there's this little girl, it's the same blonde red queen from before, who's been sitting for three hours in front of the freezers looking at bento boxes. <laughs> Uh, and she says the police won't help because she's a foreigner and the boss won't help because he's a sleazy dude. So she has no idea what to do. Uh, so she asks Kashimura to do something. Uh, and so he goes up to her and she pulls out this little ro floating rose thing, which we later find out is called a mirror gate. And she like uses it to read his whole like identity history. So we find out his name is Kashimura Zoroku and he has a daughter and then she decides that he's like a decent person. So she offers, she offers to make a deal with him that she'll grant him any wish in return if he does something for her. Uh, but he doesn't believe her. He thinks it's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> and he, she's just like, whatever, this is nonsense. And she, so she gets flustered and she teleports away. But when he goes out to his car, she's not giving up yet. She's in his back seat now. And she tries to make a deal <laughs> with him again. It's actually kind of funny because he's like, How'd you get in here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just like, what's going on? And then I would say his reactions to it, I think, are pretty good. He's not like freaking out. He's lived a long life. He's pretty grounded. So he's just like, all right, I'm just going to take this in stride. I mean, exactly. any other person I think would be like, okay, that girl just disappeared in front of my eyes. What is going on? <laughs> yeah, they'd be kind of freaking out. He's, he's more just like, ah, kids these days. <laughs> <laughs> So um, as they're sitting in a car, in the car, a huge wrecking ball appears in front of them and starts swinging down towards the car. And I think Alice uses her power. I'm calling her Alice, the Red Queen now, uh, because it's in the title of the show. And it's just easier to refer to her that way. Yeah. Uh, I think she does something to move the car out of the way. I vaguely remember her anyway. So they just barely miss the yeah, wrecking ball. She did. And we find out that there's two twin blue haired girls that are from Alice, Alice's facility who were trying to wreck the car. Uh, the younger sister has a power where she can like fire a bow and arrow uh, like out of nowhere, out of nothing. And the older sister can summon anything that's attached to a chain. Uh, and so they use these powers together uh, to like chase after the car. Like they shoot the chain and then like, like grab onto it and start like chasing after the car. Yeah. I'd also like to note that like those girls, that's basically what their powers are. is just limited to, but Alice doesn't really seem to have a limit. And this is pretty apparent yes. in the first episode. She, she just, as long as she has enough energy, she can pretty much do whatever she wants with, with her magic, as we can tell so far. Yeah. So Kajimura is like trying to drive and like avoid the, the powers of these two girls chasing them. But at a certain point, his driving isn't like good enough. So Alice takes over driving like with her mind. Um, but Yonaga, who is the younger sister with the bow, uh, pierces one of the tires and forces the car to crash. Um, and I didn't think the CGI looked that great during this scene, but it didn't really take a lot away from the show either. It was fine. Um, Passable. The sisters, yeah. yeah. And then the sisters explain to Alice that she can't live in the outside world. She has to come back to the facility with them. Uh, and they're about to shoot her with an arrow to take her down when <laughs> Zoroku jumps in and just like gives all three girls like a noogie on the head. Like, <laughs> like a good old bop. <laughs> yeah, just bops all of them like only like an old guy could get away with, like an old grandpa. And he just starts lecturing them about like how they just plowed through the middle of town causing all this destruction, how they could have easily hurt somebody with their like video game type battle. Um and there's like a huge crowd that's like watching him and like applauds him for yelling at them. It's pretty funny. Uh, and so then the girls are interrogated by the police, all three of them. Um, turns out the older twin blue hair girl's name is Asahi, like the beer. And Alice disappears from the interrogation room after giving a little bit of info. 
uh, which throws them for a loop. Like the police are looking back at the surveillance tapes and are like slowing it down, like CSI, like enhance. <laughs> and uh, they're just like, she just disappeared. I don't understand. Um, and then, but strangely, after that, everything seems to be getting covered up. Like all of the evidence from them, like destroying the town starts to disappear. All the surveillance videos are gone. All the photos from people's cell phones are gone. Even the skid marks are gone. And Kashimura is like really freaked out because his car is fully repaired too from the accident. So he immediately goes and pawns his car because he doesn't trust it. Because uh, he's an old dude and he's like, I know what happened. And um, he goes to like a diner or a bar to relax and drink, drink a beer and like trying to think through what happened. And of course, Alice appears right in front of him again. Uh, and so she tells him a little bit more. She tells him that the girls that were chasing them and her are called the dreams of Alice and that those orbs that they can use are called the mirror gates and they give the girls the ability to materialize any one thing they can imagine. So she tells Kashimura that she's decided that he's a good guy and he wants, she wants him to become her servant. And he tells her, like, shut up. <laughs> like, I'm not going to be your servant. Uh, but then he sees that she's really, really hungry because, you know, they don't feed her anything at the facility and orders her, like, a feast worth of food at this restaurant. Yeah, there's she, like, he's, like, there's, like, some side commentary from the other people sitting in there. And they're like, is she uh, practicing for a food eating contest? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, so she, like, eats it all up happily. Like, she's clearly been starving. And, uh... So then she says the deal that she wants to make with Zoraku is to help her crush the research facility so she can save her friends, the other dreams of Alice. Um, and so we find out now that her real name is Sana, uh, but it's only a name that the blue haired sisters gave to her because she can't actually remember her real name or anything before she came to the research facility. Um so realizing that she's like in a lot of trouble, Zoroku decides to offer to let him or let her live with him for like temporarily until she gets things figured out. So they take this long taxi ride back to Zoroku's work first. And when they go in, she's like really sleepy from this long ride. But she looks around the shop and realizes that there's beautiful flower bouquets everywhere. And it turns out that Zoroku's job and what he was doing for the Yakuza, Yakuza guy in the beginning was delivering flowers. Uh, and he's, yeah, he just makes flowers. And yeah, like a very flowers. In intricate flower arrangement. Yeah. And so it's funny, the Yakuza guy was actually ordering those flowers so he could propose to his girlfriend. Yeah. And that was the whole deal. It wasn't that anything too shady, actually. No, it wasn't shady at all. <laughs> yeah, not at all. So that's the end of the first double episode. Uh, and then if you want to get into episode two, let's see. Uh, so Zoraku's still like flipping through the news. Like he doesn't believe that, you know, all of the evidence of what happened has been erased. It's kind of fishy. Uh, so he calls his granddaughter Sanae, whose name is really similar to Sana's name. So we're probably going to call Sana Alice from now on just to avoid confusion. Yeah, it'll be way easier for everybody that way. Yeah. So Sana is his granddaughter. She comes over to help with Sana, or sorry, Alice, while Zoraku goes to <laughs> You're already goes breaking to her, your own yeah, rule. already broke the rule, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so she gets there and Alice is sleeping and she wakes her up and she like jumps up into the corner of the ceiling. Uh, like what's that movie, Leo? I forget. The, oh, the it's garage uh, or something. Oh, I forgot it. Yeah, it's a Japanese movie where didn't like Buffy the Vampire Slayer also did it in the American version with her. I think it's the grudge. I'm the not sure. Grudge, I, yeah. Where she's up in the corner. Yeah. It's so like that. Like even her arms, the way they're positioned is the exact same. Yeah. <laughs> um, and basically, like what while while Alice was still sleeping, she was using her power to and she teleported Sane into her dreams first. And Sane is like watching her and seeing what she's doing. And she's making these small graves. She's like a little kid, like younger than she even was. Or sorry, no. Um, Alice is watching Sane's memory through her dream. God, it's really confusing. Uh, so Sane is making these small graves. One for like a little bug that she's burying. One for her goldfish. 
and then one for each of her parents who died when she was very young. So Alice is, is able to learn about Sané's history through her dreams, basically, or through using her power to, like, enter her mind. Um, I don't think he was doing it. She didn't do it intentionally. She was asleep, right? I can't, I can't remember. I'm yeah, trying to remember asleep, that scene. Like, and she just activated her powers on accident. Yeah. Yeah. So either way, Sané is, like, really nice. She's kind of like a, a little bit of, like, an airhead, but, like... She's one of those anime characters who's always like, ah, rah, ah, rah, ah, rah, ah, <laughs> constantly with her eyes closed, basically. And then so she's like, OK, I'm going to go make you breakfast. So uh, before she leaves, though, she's still trying to make uh, Alice calm down. So she gets this like hand puppet of a little pig <laughs> and sticks it inside the door to try and coax her down from the ceiling. And Sana, or sorry, God damn it, Alice uses her mirror <laughs> gate Jeez. to bury Sana in real pigs. Like all these like real pigs just like start like infesting the room. <laughs> uh, and like Sana drags Alice down into the pile of pigs and tickles her until she like starts laughing and stuff. Uh, and then uh, gives her some of like her old clothes and does her hair really nice and makes it cute. Uh, uh, meanwhile, like, Zoroku is at work and he's calling an old friend named Ryu Naito who's going to show up later in the episode but back at home Sane is making pancakes for Alice uh, and she's got a big appetite so she wants seconds like immediately uh, so when Sane Tessel tells her it's going to take a minute she uses her mirror gate to create a giant pancake out of nothing uh, like and then you know she see just like she just looks at this giant pancake and she's like oh so overwhelmed that she faints no 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 no, no. she no they did uh they kind of showed that even her powers come with rules uh so like she knows she made the pancake so big and she even mentioned she's like i still can't do food without taking away my energy since she needs energy to use her powers so if he, she uses her powers to make food it should should be no good trade-off for her it should drain her Oh, okay. I didn't yeah, get so they that. gave that her powers, sense. some rules, and then presented it. And I liked what they did with that. It's good. Uh, but the pigs are still hungry. The pigs that are still alive from upstairs run downstairs and start eating the pancake. You make it sound like they killed the pigs off. <laughs> no, they didn't kill the pigs off, though that will come into play later on <laughs> in a later episode. For bacon. Uh, San so Sane does like a bunch of cute little girl stuff with, uh, with or no, sorry. Um, God, that's a typo. <laughs> Alice. <laughs> Al there's like a montage of Alice doing like cute little girl stuff and like having fun uh, just to sort of establish how cute she is. Uh, and then Alice mentions how much nicer Zoroku's house is than the research facility where she grew up. And like we see that she basically like lived in a cave with barely like a sheet for clothing. Uh, and she doesn't need, she didn't even like understand language. Like they didn't teach her how to speak like Japanese or anything. Um, but she could use her mirror gate to translate, um, the languages that people were speaking so she could understand, which is kind of interesting. Um, so the twins with blue hair are called the Hinagiri twins. And they were, they were the first ones that she learned to communicate with. Um, because she had to use power of speech with them because everybody else, she could just use her mirror gate to kind of mind meld and then understand what their consciousness was saying. But the blue twins had a power where they couldn't, they're different. They're the dreams of Alice as well. And she couldn't use her mind meld power on them. Uh, so she had to learn how to speak finally to communicate with them. Um, then there's like a vague scene, like one day at the research facility, she saw something going on in like the basement or like a laboratory that, and she said basically they were making something inhuman there and she got scared and decided to run away. Um, so at this point, Ryu Naito, who's Zoroku's friend, uh, is driving in a car with his younger coworker. Uh, who's a woman and tells her that he's been friends with Zoroku for like 30 years ever since he saw him yelling I hate crooked stuff at some young kids and he's <laughs> like oh I knew I had to be friends with this guy um, but they haven't like talked to each other in a while they're like, a little bit estranged and uh, meanwhile back at home Alice is finishing her pancakes and wants to find Zoroku so they can go crush the research facility together now she's, that she's like all powered up from eating uh, so she starts teleporting around, bringing Sane with her. 
Uh, first, they like start falling, like free falling from outside this huge skyscraper. That's a pretty then, good little scene. Yeah, it's pretty cool looking. And then they transport to a runway where a plane is landing, and then they like get the hell out of there, and they're on the top of like a speeding train. So like Alice like is having like like a bunch of visions all in a row, and they keep transporting next to like Antarctica where they like say hi to some penguins. And uh, I think they finally end up at like the Galapagos Islands with like a bunch of weird looking Darwin birds there and stuff. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, Sane is like, this is fun, but can we please go home? And so, or else Zoroku is going to be worried about us. So Alice finally concentrates on back home and they teleport, but she forgets that there's a bunch of pigs in the bedroom still and they all fall on the pigs. Uh, which I bet that is- bedroom's a pigsty. Oh, God. Here we go. (laughs) So she gets freaked out by the pigs and, like, instantly teleports to Soroko's flower shop. No, but But seriously, though, that room with those pigs in there that long, there'd be shit everywhere. Oh, yeah. That would smell (laughs) real bad. Um, She teleports herself, Sane, and all of the pigs to Soroko's flower shop, and they just start, like like tearing shit up all over the place wrecking the entire place and then the episode ends with Zorico like probably yelling at uh, Alice because we see her crying her eyes out <laughs> and that's how the episode is the first two episodes of this show yeah I'll say this, the chemistry between Zorico and uh, Alice is just like so spot on grandfather granddaughter yeah it's really funny I just like that he's like a grumpy old man you don't see a lot of these characters as main characters in anime ever so it's nice to see. Uh, it's like a, it's a cool relationship, and Zoroku is kind of like an old school badass, and I, I like that dynamic between him and Alice, who literally knows nothing about the world and is going to try to learn how to control her crazy powers, probably. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we would normally be doing Little Witch Academia next, but we're skipping it this week. We'll be just doing the episodes on the next uh, episode of this podcast. Because we're just trying to get through the first impressions. So moving on to Mondays, uh, you watch this one too, Frame Arms Girls. Take it. Yep, Frame Arms Girl uh, airing on Anime Network. So you may not be able to get that in the U.S. easily. Uh, Studio Zex and Studio Acat are collaborating on this. The director is Keiichiro Kawaguchi, who did Sket Dance, uh, Please Tell Me Gaoko Chan, and Mayo Chiki. Uh, so this is a blatant crash cash grab <laughs> of an anime. Uh, I was in Japan a couple weeks ago, uh, and I went into like a Kotopukiya store there looking for figures, and they had a huge Frame Arms Girl station up in front because they are a co-publisher on this show, and they're just trying to sell like the cute little girl figures and like are, they're basically like Gundam build fighters but with lewd little girls is basically what this show is yeah so, exactly what I wanted yeah Said I mean like no one. I can't say it's a bad idea like it'll probably sell <laughs> it'll probably, except yeah Correct. Uh, I think they could have done it a little bit better so moving on to the quote unquote plot of the episode <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, God, a young girl named Ao wakes up to find out she has a drone delivery to her doorstep. Uh, so Amazon drone delivery in real life, um, which she thinks might be from her dad because her dad sends her stuff sometimes. Uh, but it turns out it's a frame arms girl and her name is Gurai. Uh, and she's basically a figure that has come to life and her skirt is about six inches too short to ever cover her underwear. So basically her underwear just always showing. Always. Very important to know. So Gurai asks Ao to put her armor pieces on because she's like a gunpla. Uh, but Ao is just not into anything. She kind of just seems like a lazy girl who just doesn't care about this. And so she's like trying to get out of doing work. So she says, you know, you're you're cute the way you are. Why, why do I have to put your pieces on? And uh, instead she like inserts Gurai's charging cord into her lower back which causes Gurai to like let out like an orgasm, pleasureful moan as she gets her plug inserted. Yeah. What kind of moan do you remember? Can you can you give us an example? It was like an ah uh, kind of. Moan. Okay. Okay. Actually, that was a little sexier. I, I probably should have done that. You know. You know, a little <laughs> bit less sexy. Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so Keep Gurai, going. <laughs> Gurai explains that she is an AS equipped bot. She's got ass. So, but not a doll. 
She is an artificial self bot, which means that she comes installed with intelligence and then she will learn emotions from her owner. Problem for me is that she says that she has the intelligence of a 10 year old human. So this is a 10 year old girl we're supposed to understand. And then you, you get this little being living being intelligence, and then you raise it to be emotionally intelligent on your own, which kind of presents some moral issues, especially (laughs) with how it goes on. So Gurai instructs out on how to nip her model parts off of the bracket. Uh, And they're also like trying to sell like the Kotobukiya like model nip tool, like in this episode, because this is all advertisement for model building. And so at one point, Al loses a small part from like the little nip board underneath their couch or something. So she gets on her hands and knees with her butt up in the air and exposes it to the camera as she searches all around the room, more fan service. Uh, But as she's doing this, she finds a family photo and she shows it to her photo album and she shows it to Gurai, the little frame mom scroll. She explains her dad found a job overseas and so her mom went with him. So she's living on her own, which is the most original setup for anime. (laughs) Uh, Through the pictures, Gurai starts to learn about emotions because she sees that Ao has like an emotional reaction to her parents. And so she's starting to learn a little bit. Um, but the next day, two more Frame Arms girls show up in another box, and their names are Stilet and Base Lard. Uh, and so, st- <laughs> Lard, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So, Stilet oh, but that's not st- the worst of the namings yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. There's gonna be weird, weird names coming up today. So, Stilet or Stilet wants to battle like immediately, but Base Lard is just asleep in her box looking cute. So, they talk to Gurai and they're like, hey, you're actually one of a kind. Nobody else in the world has activated a Gurai model yet. So Ao has received basically a like guinea pig test model. It's like a beta test for Gurai. And so they're trying to convince Gurai to fight them because um, y- they're going to like the makers, the manufacturers of the frame arms girls need more data uh, on Gurai so they can make her model better. Um, so they challenge her to a fight and Ao is saying, no, you can't fight in here. You're going to wreck the whole apartment. Except they're like, no, we have this trademark session base you can use, which is a stand where they can, you can put the girls. And I saw this in Japan. You can buy these in Kotobukiya to like put the girls on and pretend like you're battling with them kind of thing. Uh, and so what the base does is it projects a virtual battlefield around the apartment where they can fight. Um, so Gurai starts fighting Steelette, uh, and she's losing at first because it's actually really funny. Ao did a really shitty job putting Gurai together or like putting her parts on. So they're all like hanging off and they're like not calibrated at all well. So she can barely fire her little guns. Um, but through a mix of terrible CG and incomprehensible physics, <laughs> she is able to defeat Stilet in this terrible looking fight scene. Uh, and so the show finishes out with like a really cheap and really badly animated ED. And then at that point, in maybe the show's only funny moment, which is in the end credits, we find out this is a joint production of Kotobukiya, the figure shop, like I said before. And it's called the FAG Girl Project. Or the Fag Girl Project, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, naming. capital F, capital A, capital G, IRL. Fag Girl. So that's Frame Arms Girl. It is <laughs> very generic uh, and very cash grabby and very please go to Kota Bakia and buy our stuff. So yeah, let's move on to the next show. Okay, that looks pretty good. Uh, Grimoire of Zero, you can watch this on Anime Strike. The Japanese title is Zero Kara Hajimeru Maho no Show. Studio White Fox, director Tetsuo Hirakawa. First time director, so. Good luck. Uh, episode one, The Witch and the Beast Fallen. Uh, it starts off with a medieval setting type world where uh, the witches have been per- persecuted by the church for using sorcery. Uh, and then the ch- after a certain point, the witches then, you know, in self-defense, defend the fight back also. Then we're also introduced to our first character, who is a beast fallen, who looks like a white tiger. Uh, he's also being hunted by the medieval towns because they're a part of the witchcraft at some point. Uh, 
they just explain that humans occasionally give birth to a half human slash half beast, and they are thought to be instruments of the witch's sorcery. So they have large bounties on their heads. They just want them killed. Anything to do with witchery, witchcraft, whatever. Uh, we then have a short scene of a young witch uh, leaving her home, which is like a cave. Yeah. And then a dream of the, a flashback dream of the beast fallen guy asking his parents if they're afraid of him. But his mother's like, no, nah, I would never be afraid of you. You have these big, adorable eyes and your fa- your mouth is always set in a smile, stuff like that. It's just his parents yeah. clearly love him. That's it was cute. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they kind of figure out uh, he's well, then the beast fallen is then eventually being chased through a forest by some other witch who's using a bow of like a magic sorcery type uh he eventually ends up stumbling off a cliff and it's like one heck of a height so these uh beast fallen are sturdy guys mm-hmm. falls all th- through these trees and then right in front of the girls which is campfire and knocks over her soup which is very important it pisses her <laughs> off <laughs> but then he's like there are bigger problems right now than to worry about your soup and then that's like when an arrow lands and right next to him she's like oh that is a bigger problem <laughs> so he <laughs> So he picks up the girl and they start running away. And then the girl's like, they just some monologue here. And the girl's like, put me down. He's like, I can't put you down. We're being chased. And like, she grabs on this like tree branch over the top of her and gets off him. And then proceeds to encase the other witch and like basically a mud tomb. Uh, She declares herself to be a mud black witch who can create things from nothingness. And then it's kind of funny because as she's talking, the beast fallen runs away because he hates witches himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just runs off. He's like, and, I don't want to have anything to do with this situation. Yeah, what's really sung to me in, in this uh, first episode was that it also, again, really good dynamics between the beast fallen and the witch. Like tons of funny moments sp- mm. specifically from the witch herself. Uh, so eventually beast fallen thinks he's in the clear and he sits down and he makes campfire and he's making his soup. But then he's sitting there looking at his map. And uh, when he's not looking, the girl witch has snuck up and is like eating his soup, which I guess, as you say, is only fair since he spilled hers. Um, they have a long scene of sort of trying to be and basically accepting her as a witch and not being so afraid of her. She says something along the lines of, you know, I can still see your human face hiding behind that appearance. Uh she explains which has created the beast fallen soldiers in the past to fight battles. Um, and she eventually guilt trips him into giving her more of the soup. Uh, <laughs> she also tells him that she's looking for a man named 13. Mm-hmm. He, because he had left earlier from their little witch enclave to look for a stolen book that was stolen from them. And it's really important because this book's extremely, extremely powerful. It could almost potentially lead to the end of the world. Uh, she's herself also been the freaking target of witch hunt. So she has to be spawned to be her guard on her journey. He says no, because he hates witches and hates humans too, who tell him to stay out of their towns and stores because of his appearance. Uh, she convinces him by telling him she can turn him back into a human, but they need to make a blood contract. Not this scene's really cool. Uh, she swears she won't kill him. And when his guard duty is complete, she'll turn him back. Uh, she gains his trust by telling him he has a soft appearance like his mother told him in some flashback and that he smells like a cellar, a place she is fond of. You put for some reason, but she did live in a cave. Makes sense to me. Yeah, that's true. That makes sense. Yeah. I wondered uh, if they were, I didn't know if they were implying that she'd been to that same cellar at some point, but I, I, it was hard to tell. But like, yeah, their living places were very similar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he spent a lot of time uh, like hiding in the barn. When people mm-hmm. were trying to run him out of his town. Uh, so she writes up this blood contract and she's about to activate the contract, but then he takes it from her and tears it up. But instead he presses his thumb to hers where they had just pricked him for the blood contract and tells, uh, tells him we'll just do a mercenaries blood contract. She's like, all right, this works too. He has basically come to accept and trust her. Uh, she tells him her name is zero numbers. <laughs> yeah. He's he's about to say his name, but she stops him and says she only calls her man servants by name, and that mercenary will be just fine. <laughs> There's just another little bit of the dynamics. Uh, Zero isn't her real name, but she jokes that if he ever tries to figure out her real name, she'll make him her obedient servant or like kill him or he'll regret it or something along those lines. Uh, the Beast Fallen has a nightmare flashback to when he got 
out of being trapped in the cellar or barn, and he took revenge on the human hunters, which were other mercenaries, and basically killed his parents, and he tears them to pieces and kills them all. He, he wakes up to find that Zero has basically curled up on top of his stomach slash chest and fallen asleep. He yeah, throws her a, off. <laughs> I was going to say, she's like a pretty small girl, like in, yeah, a, she's, in she's stature. Tiny. And I think yeah. they did it without her making her look like she's way young. She's just a small bodied person. I agree. Yeah. She, yeah, she's not, I don't know. I, I'd have to see more if I'd even call her a lolly yet, but she's, and she seems mature well beyond 16, I guess. I would not call her one. Yeah. Cause she has also, she like also besides not being like super young looking, she's also not been like sexualized like a lolly, which is yeah. one of my like definition terms for. Calling yeah. My definition that. for a lolly is an underage girl being sexual sexualized in some way. Basically, so yeah. they haven't done that, so I can't call her one. Yeah. Uh, but he throws her off, and, <laughs> and she said he should felt privileged to be sleeping with an unrivaled beauty in his arms. <laughs> like this, yeah. this show's just peppered with these little jokes, and they're really funny. Yeah, she's uh, she's a little arrogant, and uh, I like that about her. She's got a little attitude on her. She's like arrogant, and she knows she's arrogant, so oh, she yeah. just goes with it. It's great. Uh, they make breakfast, and Zero says she can track Thirteen's man into the capital. Um, on their way, Zero decides to show the mercenaries some sorcery uh, when they are attacked by a huge elder boar. Uh, she uses her magic to ensnare it, and then she eventually lets it go because it's illegal to kill him. Mm -hmm. It turns out the witch from earlier had kind of set that boar on them, and she knows he's in a tree hiding behind them. And it turns out just to be a young boy named Albus who was, uh, like I just said, chasing him. He said he needs the beast fallen head so he can get stronger and attack Zero, but Zero completely shuts him down with her own magic. He tells her he learned his magic from a group of sorcerers of Zero whose holy book is called the Grimoire of Zero. And Zero's like, yeah, I wrote that book. So yeah. there you go. Yep. That's basically the first episode. And then yeah. I mentioned the ED I love. It's a really soft gentle song over these like cute images of zero like peeking out at uh the mercenary from behind a tree and then like getting closer and closer to him and then and, like jumping on his stomach and like curling up to cuddle it's like what we didn't see from that uh that earlier scene basically is like her like deciding if she could do that while <laughs> he was asleep it's just really cute um, yeah i'm really digging the lore in the uh comedy in the show i can't wait to watch some more yeah, like Alice and Zaroku, I just really like this dynamic between the the Beast Fallen and uh, the character of Zero. I think they're both really interesting. I hope to find out more about them going forward. All so right. you you should take this next one. Yeah, also. Uh, the Laughing Salesman. You can watch this on Crunchyroll Studio Shinai Animation. Director Ogura Hirofumi. Um, he hadn't really directed anything else, but just episodes of Gintama and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Stardust Crusaders, really the only things I could find worth mentioning. Uh, episode one is actually a two-parter. It's two totally different stories. It starts off with the laughing salesman uh, introducing himself, basically. He's a man named Moguro Fukuzo. Uh, he deals in filling the holes in people's hearts, which comes out to make no sense whatsoever. <laughs> man is he from persona 5 <laughs> uh per persona 5 makes sense though yeah. well parts of it too <laughs> i'm four hours into it i'm at the first palace so i'm getting ready to take out whatever the guy's name is he he something no spoilers <laughs> uh that one wasn't spoilers so anyways <laughs> his name moguro fukuzoa Deals in filling the holes in people's hearts. His first subject is an office worker who's just kind of depressed with this job. Uh, his co-worker invites him out to lunch one day. And he takes him down and they have like... The way Japanese buildings, some of them are designed. They're like, there'll be office buildings on some floors. And then there'll be like a shopping district on one or a restaurant yeah. district. Crazy stuff like that. But there's a... Instead of going to like their restaurant district, he goes to a different floor... And he takes him to a club called Daydream, where you can drink during the day, and the hostesses are gorgeous. They're in there having a drink when, uh, and hanging out with the, obviously the gorgeous hostesses. When Fukuzo shows up and says, "Today is on him," uh, they barely make it back to work, just just a little bit late. Uh, our main character he tries to visit the club again uh, after work hours, 
because he has fallen for one of the hostesses like super hard. He asks her for her. He asks for her when he gets there, and it turns out to be an ugly chick with the same name. So he leaves the club and immediately runs into Fukuzo. Uh, he explains that during the night it's like in the other club and it's only special during the day. Uh, the next day at work, the two go back to the club daydream again. Uh, Fukuzo shows up and tempts him into having a stiff drink. They get completely smashed and ask for their bill since they have to go back to work. It's 400,000 some yen, Jeez. which is outrageous. He gives him a 10,000 yen bill and says he'll be back with the rest. Uh, they get back to work and get yelled at by their boss. End of episode. Yeah, that's weird. That's- I, I, there's, <laughs> shouldn't there have been like a lesson learned or something like that? Yeah, that seems like uh, yeah, a I lot of stuff happening no for idea no what this episode reason. was supposed to be, out, be about. Uh, so I'm like, okay, maybe it has something to do with this second part that's clearly d- d- different. Uh, we start with... Uh, what do they call him? An Ojo-san? Which is an office lady? Is that right? Well, an Ojo-san is like an older one. Oh, that's just an older yeah. lady. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah like a, or like a or like a queen-like it. lady, I think, actually. Is what oh, Ojo-san yeah. Is. I totally messed one up. Ignore me. <laughs> uh, it's an office lady who's depressed this time with her situation at her work where she's basically being bullied by the other office ladies who have their own little clique and exclude her and make fun of her behind her back and clear earshot distance. But she gets relief from this by going shopping, which is a literal thing. They actually suggest, you know, shopping makes people in releases endorphins makes you happy. They say, like, even shopping online, just putting stuff in the cart and not buying it will release these endorphins. It's only temporary happiness, though. <laughs> yeah, it's temporary. Uh, she ends up purchasing a bag. And the next day she's at the office. The office ladies are all making fun of her for a bag. So, you know, so to get over this, of course, she goes shopping again. But her credit card gets declined because she was at her limit when she bought the bag. Uh, This is when Fukuzo shows up and offers her a limitless credit card. But the catch is anything she purchases will be repossessed the very next day. Uh, After a couple nights of enjoying shopping and then everything taken away from her the next day, she kind of says to herself, she's like, this isn't fun anymore. You know, I only, it's no fun when I know it's going to be taken away immediately the next day. Uh, so she just thinks she can get around it a little bit by going to a spa that she kind of got from the idea of overhearing one of the office ladies. So she like, gets a massage, she gets a mud bath, she gets her nails done, she gets her hair done. The whole nine yards plus an extra 60. It's just this complete makeover. Uh, <laughs> and she like meets with this guy at a bar and he buys her a drink and then he's taking her home and he drops her off at her street and he gives her a kiss and she's just in pure bliss at this moment uh, part when she's walking home. Uh, but that's when Fukuzo, oh, oh, hair scary, like appears out of an alley and says, you thought you could get away with it since some of the things weren't material possessions. Uh, she then wakes up the next day as a fat old lady. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, it's a little harsh. The, you know, if the show had some lessons learned, it would it wouldn't be bad. I would enjoy it, but it doesn't. And I actually felt really sorry for the office lady. She wasn't a bad person. She was actually a, a pretty nice. She was a good person. She didn't cause trouble for anybody else. If anything, those other office ladies deserved some backlash. But, and let's be honest, her credit card company loved her. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, I can't keep watching this. There's nothing to go on here. So. The only thing I liked about this show was the OP, which was like a kind of like funky style and uh, it looked pretty cool. Oh, but did yeah. you actually finally watch it? I uh, watched the first episode, but uh, yeah. Were, were, I, were, did you watch it to see if you could make sense of it? <laughs> yeah, I was like, did Leo miss anything with this? And I was like, nope, no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad I have a second opinion because I was like, I there's no way I missed the the point of both shows. But yeah, I just, what? Why? No, that was just pointless. Yeah, I, I love the OP. I mean, I would... I wish the whole show was just the OP. I would watch it every week. <laughs> but let's move on to Tuesdays and Akashic Records of Bastard Magical Instructor, which is on Crunchyroll. Uh, the Japanese title is Roku Danashi Majutsu Koshi to Akashic Records. Uh, and the studio is Leiden Films. Uh, director is Minato Kazuto, who is also a first time director. So we've got two first time directors so far. Um, uh, 
Episode one is called The Unmotivated Bastard. Uh, so the show is set in this city called Fajite in the southern region of the Alzano Empire, which is home to the Alzano Imperial Magic Academy. Yes, this is a light novel, probably. Uh, <laughs> So we first meet this blonde girl uh, who is in a school outfit that is made up of like more her showing skin than actual outfit, I would say. Like a lot of people I've read online have prepared this to basically like more something they would think a stripper would wear than a schoolgirl. It's got or like you a- come home and see your wife or girlfriend wearing this and you're like i know what's happening tonight <laughs> yeah oh, I'm, i got something good yeah you're happening. not the only one i saw talking about this i saw multiple people being like yeah even for fan service they were like that's a little, it's going a little far guys <laughs> yeah it's got like short skirts and belts and garters everywhere but and suspenders but yeah did you see the screenshot some screenshots that uh jlist.com peter payne tweeted out today no not today why oh is it from this show? Yeah. It's like yeah. episode three. Yeah, I've seen episode three, so I'm it sure. It has the entire class and like their bras and panties with garter belts. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's actually in one of these episodes. I'm going to get to that. So that's... Oh, I don't remember you saying it last time. Uh, yeah, I went over it kind of quickly. We'll see. You'll see it again. Um, <laughs> God, yeah, this show has a lot of fan service in it. So, um, uh, yeah, so the, this blonde girl who we first meet is named Rumia. Uh, and she's like out, like on her way to school, and she sees a man who has like a an, a wound onto his hand, an injury. So she heals it with magic, but she's like, Shh, "Be quiet! Like magic is forbidden to use outside the academy. So just keep this a secret between us." Uh, and then as she gets towards school, she meets up with a purple-haired girl named Sisty or Lady Sistine, uh, who she calls. And um, she has like a ribbon that she wears in her hair that she ties up so it looks like cat ears, basically. Just more fetishes to put into her character design, basically. <laughs> um and they, they're talking about how their normal teacher suddenly quit, so they're getting a new substitute today. And then, wouldn't you know it, this young guy with black hair runs towards them. Uh, he's in a hurry, and they use this, like, he's, like, running like, right towards them. So, like, they use this wind power to launch him up into the air and drop him into a fountain in the middle of this square. And he gets out of the fountain, like, he moves the, like... He brushes the hair out of his face like a bishonin. He's like, hey, guys. And then um, he sees Rumi, a little blonde girl. And for some reason, he like approaches her like he might know her. And then he goes a little far because he starts like frisking her and then like checking every part of her body, like looking up, like picking up the edge of her skirt and looking underneath it. Like that's something important that he has to check. Uh, so Sisty gets pissed and like punches him again, but we later find out this guy's named Glenn Radars and we see a faculty member. Radars? Yeah. Glenn Radars, like the radar operator or something. Yeah. It's a weird name. Uh, we see that like facts, some there's a headmaster and another faculty member, like wondering if he's really fit for this job, but he came highly recommended by one of the teachers there, whose name is Celica. Um, but like while they're wondering about this, we see him get to class and obviously Sisti and Rumia are kind of shocked that he's their new teacher because of how they met him. Uh, and he like gets there. He's really like not into the class at all. He writes, he takes a piece of chalk and writes on the blackboard self study in huge letters and then just like sits down behind the desk and like <laughs> lets them study. Um, the professor who recommended him is this witch named Celica. Uh, and She's like this big boobed blonde woman. Uh, and she claims that she'll take full responsibility for any th- of Glenn's screw ups if he does screw up. But he, she has a lot of confidence in him. But meanwhile, Glenn is being a really crappy teacher in class. She's not answering any of their questions. And as soon as the bell rings, he bolts and just leaves. So he's clearly not into this. Um, but now that we've made it halfway into episode one of this show, it's time for the girls to go get undressed in the locker room. Uh, and this, Leo, is where that screenshot would have been posted from. Oh, uh, okay. It's, it's all of the girls in the school, like, in, like, their bras and panties. And we find out that Sisty is one of those characters who is, like, a boob fondler. So she comes up behind Rumia and, like, starts grabbing her breasts. And then 
Rumia actually reacts like they're basically in a hentai or a doujin because she starts <laughs> getting like really red in her face and like is like on the verge of orgasm when who walks into the locker room but Glenn Radars because he's like, oh, whoops. I went into the long, wrong locker room, but then he like yells at them and he, cause like they all start to get horrified and are like yelling at him to get out. He's like, no, this isn't my fault. So I'm just going to burn this image into my eyes before I leave. And I'm just like, dude, leave the fucking locker room. How old uh, are these girls supposed to be? Uh, that's a good question. High school aged, I suppose. Uh, maybe it's middle school, but probably like 14 to 16 age, probably. Uh, oh japan (laughs) um so then a bunch of uh nothing happens for the rest of the episode um but sisty is finally fed up with glenn and the way he doesn't teach them so she takes her glove off which is part of her uniform and throws it on the ground in front of him which is her way of challenging him to a magic duel so he actually accepts the duel, which surprises everybody. But so they go out to like the courtyard and he's like, okay, the rules are we're only going to use this one spell called shock bolt. And the reason they use that is because it's a safe spell. It can only paralyze your opponent. So it won't do any crazy damage or hurt anybody. So they get ready and they're like, oh, is Glenn going to like be able to beat Sisty? Like she's the top student. And in like two seconds, she beats him. <laughs> it's like, apparently in this world, the faster that you can chant uh, an enchantment, like the faster you can get an attack off. So he's like too slow at saying the words. So Sisty beats him like almost instantly. So that was a really bad first episode. Like, and I kind of would have almost dropped it just after that with like the level of dialogue and like how Glenn had no redeeming qualities whatsoever yet. But let's move on to episode two. Let's give it one more shot. Which is surprising me because I see people enjoying this show. Yes. And I intersected and I brought up something specific that happens in episode two. And they're like, yeah, that was awkward. And yeah, I was like, really? <laughs> That's all you got from that? But go on. Yeah, I think a lot of people will ignore the horrible thing that happens in episode two because of some other good character developments. Cause let's be, we'll be, I'll be honest. Glenn gets better in episode two. So, uh, at the beginning, Sisty's in an argument with, about, with Glenn in class about what the point of even studying magic is in this universe. And she's like put on the spot and she comes up with an answer like, well, it's about reaching a higher plane of existence. But he's, he's saying that's nonsense and it's clearly not as useful as studying medicine is because that would actually help people. Um, so, But then he's like, oh, but I lied. Actually, magic is really useful for one thing and that's killing other people. So clearly Glenn is very jaded about magic. Um, Sisty gets really upset because she's, you know, very pure and naive about this. And she slaps him and like runs out of the classroom crying. Um, did she so, yell Baka when she did it? No, she only does that later in this episode. Oh. <laughs> Actually, she might have, but she does it again later. Baka! Uh, Glenn is She's like, gone. Glenn is actually like kind of upset about this. He's like thinking about quitting because he realizes he went a little too far. Uh, but he sees in a classroom across the way, he's like standing on the roof of the school building, that Rumia is practicing making magic circles, like summoning circles. So he goes over and finds her and... She tells him that she's having trouble completing the circle and he actually goes into teacher mode for once and he tells her like you're concentrating too much on the theory of the circle and not looking and thinking about the things that you can fix that are right in front of you. And he takes out like this vial of mercury dust or whatever and starts pouring it around the circle to make it more substantial. And once he does that, he tells her to try it again and she does and like the summoning circle is really beautiful and perfect. And she's like really impressed by Glenn and like she's never made a circle that looked this good before. So she starts, they leave and like she starts asking him questions about himself. And so he tells Rumia that he's been a hikikomori basically for the past year, just like living off Celica's goodwill. Um, But he won't tell her what he was doing before this past year. Uh, uh, And so that's a little bit mysterious. So Rumia tells him that She just wants to learn magic to benefit humanity, but she also has a personal stake. She wants to pay back a debt that she owes to this mage of justice who rescued rescued her three years ago when she was captured by some evil mages. 
Uh, and we see a flashback of this Mage of Justice, and he looks exactly like Glenn from behind, like it's an open secret. And Glenn even asks her, are you... And we remember he kind of recognized her from episode one, too. So it's basically confirmed that he's the guy who saved her before. Apparently looking up her skirt is how he recognizes her, too, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really important for identification purposes, you know. Uh, <laughs> so we get a scene of Sisty who's having a flashback to her uh, late grandfather's deathbed. Uh, and he was telling her that he was a mage too. And his whole life, he was trying to reach this place called Malgalius's Sky Castle, but he could never get there. And Sisti, as a little girl, told him that she would do everything in her power to become a mage and fulfill his wishes. So that's how she feels about magic. And that's why she's so upset by Glenn. But to her surprise and everybody's surprise, at the start of class the next day, Glenn comes in and he's bowing in apology for what he did the day before. Uh, and then he goes, he starts like acting like a real teacher. He tells them, you know, you laugh about that duel we had yesterday with Shockbolt, but it seems like you guys haven't actually mastered it yourselves. And he shows them that if you break up the chant into th like four parts, the sentence that you have to say instead of three parts, it totally changes the outcome of the spell. Uh, as does like using different words or like saying it quick, quicker or faster. Like you can change the direction that the spell goes or like the strength of the spell. So he actually knows a lot more about magic and enchantments than he was letting on. Um, and then he uses Sisti as a way to prove that just uh, using words can change the human heart by going up to her in class and saying, Oh, little white cat, which is what he calls her. I love you so much. And so she turns beet red and like gets really embarrassed. And she's, he's like, yeah, look class, like my words just proved my point. And then she gets really upset and throws her textbook at him and screams, baka, 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 like you wanted her to. Oh gosh. <laughs> so, uh, basically at, after that point, Glenn starts to become a very popular teacher because he starts actually teaching and Celica's bragging to the headmaster about how she was right about him all along. Yay uh, for Celica. And so everything's going good. Glenn's starting to turn into a good character and then something really horrible happens. So <laughs> evil mages attack the academy and they're looking for like, Rumia. Like they all, like it always happens. Yes. Yeah, like always. Like evil mages do. And uh, turns out her full name is Rumia Tinjo, but then one of the evil mages is like, actually, you're Princess Armiana, and we know that you've been in hiding. Uh, so she's a princess who nobody knew, basically, except maybe the headmaster of the school. Uh, and then while they're taking her away, for some reason, we get this scene where one of the evil mages pulls Sisti into a Which side room. Sisti? Sisti is the one with purple hair and cat ear ribbon. Okay. <clears throat> who is like very prim and proper. So he takes her into his side room and he's like, uh, he starts like forcing himself on her basically. And he tells her like, yeah, your friend wouldn't have been worth it because she had determination in her eyes. But you, I can break your mind and you're the exact kind of girl who I like to take advantage of. Because like you say, she's prim and proper and you always want to see those types be pulled down. That's what yeah. they're going for, right? Basically. Yeah. But at the same time, the camera starts like lingering on her body as he like undresses her. Like he takes her shirt off and then he starts like taking her undershirt off and like lifting it over her breasts and her bra. Like it's a very like long lingering scene and she starts crying and like praying for somebody to help her. Oh and it's God. really awful. It's like a really leer, leer, lurid like rape scene that or attempted rape scene because Glenn shows up. And then the worst part of the scene happens. So Glenn walks God. in and he says, this is, this is Glenn sees his student being sexually assaulted by an evil mage. And he decides I'll make a joke out of this. And he says, Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt and starts leaving. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, this is how you're going to build this character into. And a you said like, character. Sisty's like crying. She's and crying. She's about to be sexually assaulted. I'm sure she's never had this happen to her before. It's a <laughs> horrible time. Like it's a horrible moment for her. You don't make a joke about that. Like, especially with one of your students, like, but Glenn is supposed to be such a funny character. So ha ha ha. Oh, my student's getting raped. Oh, make a joke. That's, that's how the show goes. So anyway, Glenn, Ugh. 
eventually comes back after she screams for him to come back and help her and comes in and he uses this magic spell that he has created himself called fool's world. Uh, and what the spell does is it causes all magic in like a radius around him not to be able to activate. So he can't use magic and the mage can't use magic. So basically it just means they have to use physical fighting. So he gets into a fist fight and he's like winning the fist fight. And then he's like, I'm going to finish you off with my magical punch. And so he gets ready, like he's going to punch him. And then he just kicks him in the balls and knocks him down. <laughs> it's like, that's his magic punch is a fake punch. And then a kick. Uh, so kick to the balls, kick yeah. to the groin. Exactly. So, um, like you said, like some people are liking Glenn's character for me using the rape scene for one fan service and two comedy was just too much. And I was like, no, nah, I'm dropping the show. Like I was just done at that point. I don't blame you. I mean, I, I understand if people can get over that, but like, it's just, it's just, there's no point for me to watch that show at, at that point. If the right. And you're going to always that. remember that about that character. You're like, yeah, he's, you're like, he's, he's un in your eyes. He's unredeemable at that point. Exactly. There's nothing this guy can do that will make me like him. <laughs> yeah. It's just like the writers went too far. They went to they, there's a million ways they could have made like Sisty like Glenn. And I think this is what that scene is really used for is for both the audience is supposed to think that Glenn is funny and kind of an asshole. And they're also supposed to realize that Sisty now likes Glenn because he saved her from getting sexually assaulted. <laughs> only after she begged. Only after she begged for it. Uh, but uh, yeah, you and I were talking about this and we were like, can, can rape jokes or rape related jokes ever work in anime? And we and thought, under very, very, very specific circumstances. Yeah. We were thinking back to Konosuba's second season that we just watched. And uh, the joke where darkness like sacrifices herself to Cosma at the, for the, at the trial or sacrifices herself for Cosma and gets taken away to this castle where Cosma and Aqua just assume that she's getting sexually abused. <laughs> and um, you're, you're, yeah, you're led to think the exact same. This looked like an old pervy dude. He's going to sexually abuse her. Yeah. And she's there for like a week or a couple of weeks and she finally comes back and they're both like, they both like presume the worst. They both go up to her and they're like, there, there, you can cry if you need to. And she's like, what? What are you talking about? And they're like, we know, we know. <laughs> yeah, Kazu <laughs> Ka Kazuma's like, just go ahead, take a long, hot bath, relax. We can talk about it if you want. And it's under the presumption that she was being raped. Yeah, and there's a lot and of reasons is to think that she would be because like she's yeah. a masochist, the sadomasochist. And also they're both assholes. <laughs> so it's kind of in their character to think this. And then I was thinking about why this joke kind of worked. And like, number one, first of all, darkness was not actually raped. So that's a big deal. Like, so you can kind of laugh about it to nothing even remotely close to rape. We saw happening to her. Like we saw her being like undressed, but that was for a different reason. Clearly they were just trying, the servants were like trying to dress her up or something like that. Exactly. And then, yeah. Like, number three, I said, I think this is the most important. Like, this is, like, a well-established series at this point. And all of the characters were established as, like, kind of assholes or kind of masochists. And we knew how they would react in this situation. Yeah, so it was, it made they were sense. all 100% in character. Yeah. For this one, yeah. it's the second episode of the series. And they're trying to sell Glenn's character to us, basically. And this is just not a good way to do that. So, But either way, I don't ever advise doing rape jokes. <laughs> Yeah, it's just almost always a terrible idea. Yes, yes, yes. So let's move on. All right, to our next show. <laughs> I'll do the English title. You can do the Japanese title this time. Okay. What do you do at the end of the world? Are you busy? Will you save us? And please give us the Japanese title and try not to trip up. <laughs> the full Japanese title is Shumatsu Nani Shite Maska? Isogashi Deska? Sukute Morate I Deska? Which is shortened to Suka Suka, thank God. <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, studio Satelight and C2C. Two studios, interesting. Yeah. Uh, director Junichi Wada, he did uh, Disappearance of Nagato Yuki Chan and Ragnar Strike Angels. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, I haven't watched it either, but uh, Disappearance of Nagato Yuki Chan was kind of disappointing in my opinion so <sighs> so we start off with a red hair girl 
talking about how some guy made her so, 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 so happy. It stresses this. <laughs> and and that right now she knows she's the happiest girl in the world. Again, she's stressing this. Then she jumps off the airship. Airship. All righty then. Uh, skip to Island 28. Town of Grimjahal. Whatever main blue haired girl chasing a cat with a pendant in its mouth. Uh, she finally corners it. She, they're like up on some scaffolding, but then the cat jumps at her and they both are falling off that scaffolding. And importantly, she says something about not being able to generate venenum in time. Uh, we see a man in the crowd do some like special magic move fast stuff and he basically breaks her fall with his body. Uh, her hat comes off and everybody, she, and everybody uh, sees that she's a human. And by the way, let me know that everybody else is a beast type humanoid. Yeah, and they, guess, they called her a disfeatured is what they call her, which is weird. Oh, did they? Yeah. yeah well, they did dis discriminate against uh, her for being uh, a human, basically. Uh, the guy who broke her fall covers her head with his hat and grabs her arm and they run off together. Uh, this is when he buys her a witch looking hat, which is basically her signature look. Excuse me. And then she asked him to escort her somewhere. It's now we get this very long scene of them wandering around and getting lost a lot. And it, yeah, this is uh, set to the Simon and Garfunkel song, uh, Scarborough Fair, as sung by some female vocalists. And I just thought I'd point that out because it was actually kind of pretty. It's pretty sounding. So, but you could take it away. <laughs> oh, I didn't notice that. I'm surprised. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty long scene, but they finally make it to the spot where she wanted to see. And it's a view, which is basically in the middle of the city, but really high. She's like, I'm so glad you sh showed me such a good time. And she's like, but my time is up now. And then like some dudes walk up and go to take her somewhere. And she says that he should forget he ever met her. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the way, I'm calling them dude a moo girl because we don't get names yet. I'll Not yet. And when we do get names, it is glorious. Oh, and when we do get names, I'm sad I ever asked for them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it turns out the guy is a salvager. And he lands a job for the army to be a caretaker of a, quote, warehouse holding special weapons on the French sky of Archipelago Regulus Isle, Island 68. <sighs> and then this is the part where I noted I wish this show would give me names already. <laughs> yeah. So he goes to the island. He's walking on some like old wooden pathways that are over like kind of a swamp area, shallow water. He's attacked by a small girl with a wooden sword. Uh, cute little fight scene as she's trying to hit him. Well, she ends up tripping up and like the wooden supports give away. And uh, she's about to fall in when the dude kind of grabs her and like spins and he lands on his back and he's holding her up out of the water. And then that's when blue hair girl from earlier comes running up and scolding the little girl. And of course the two are like, what the heck when they finally see each other. Uh, we then have a uh, fast forward to the guy taking a shower at the place where he's supposed to be. And you would note that he's covered in like tons of scars. Just his whole body is just scarred up. Uh, he hears a knock on the door and he answers it and he's greeted by a name that he's a maid. Bleh, I'm stuck on names. A maid that he seems to know, and she is named Nyglatho. <laughs> N Y G G L A T H O. <laughs> how 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 did you put all these people's names? Are like ancient. oh yeah, they're like uh, Lovecraftian names or something like something between like a Cthulhu monster and like somebody sneezing or something. I think I read this in a, a review of the show online. It's not my <laughs> own original. Uh, thing yeah. but it made too much sense and she also calls him willem so i'm like yay finally some names yeah his and last name is also kmetch it's willem kmetch yeah <laughs> like i was i would expect his name to be like wilhelm but it's just willem which is yeah. just weird to me so it seems that nigalatho is a troll <laughs> <laughs> Even though she just looks like a busty maid. Uh, she also apparently really, really, really wants to eat Wilhelm, but she knows she shouldn't. So she reframes. Uh, it turns out they're being spied on by four little girls. And they're like leaning on the doorway and they fall in. And then like Nye Glatho threatens them to go to bed or she will eat them and they run off. And she ends up taking Wilhelm to his own room. But the little four little girls are back. 
and they of course again fall through the doorway as they're trying to listen to him uh, and it basically it, and then all four of the girls are in there and it basically turns to a q a for well home but first we get to learn their names uh we get the first girl colon yep c-o-l-l-o-n-n yeah she's got pink hair and she's a little bit mischievous yeah and then we got panty bowl p-a-n-n-i-b-a-l yeah that's the purple haired girl who had uh tackled him before when the, he first arrived all right then we get uh tiat which is basically the simplest one so far her, so far she's got green hair and she's kind of an airhead <laughs> <laughs> and then lakish l-a-k-h-e-s-h and she's got blonde hair and she's constantly apologizing. And in the show, they keep, they don't even pronounce her name like Lakash. They, like, whenever I hear them pronounce it in Japanese, they're always like Lakash or something. Like, so I don't know what to think her name actually is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd only seen that first episode. I didn't see anything after that. Mm -hmm. But then our blue hair girl shows up and tells the kids to go to bed. So they go. And then we finally get her name. And I still regret it because it's Kasuli. <laughs> Yeah, so this is where we get, like, a real big Cthulhu monster hint. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Wilhelm is still curious about where the special weapons are. Are they supposed to be watching over? And she basically explains, oh, the girls are the special weapons. Um, after the end credits, there's a scene set 526 years in the past. The guy looks totally 100% like Wilhelm. And he's having a conversation with another girl about what he will do when he comes back from the final battle. Uh, the narrator finishes by saying that humans were wiped out within the next year after that battle, and the guy never came back. What the hell is this show about? <laughs> it's pretty interesting first episode, I have to say. Uh, I was actually kind of bored with it because I got nothing but questions. I got all questions, no answers. And I feel yeah. like it's, there's just there's so many questions, it's going to be overwhelming. And if I get left in the dark too long on certain things, I just drop them because I'm like, I still don't understand what's going on. I'm just one of those people I need I need to know what's happening. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I'll check out more, but we'll I'll have to wait and see if I really do like it or not. Okay. Um, I'll take the next show. It is The Royal Tutor, which is on Crunchyroll. Uh, the Japanese title is Oshitsu Kyoshi Haine, uh, and the studio is Bridge. Uh, the director is Katsuya Kikuchi, who did Idle Memories. Uh, episode one was called The Royal Tutor Arrives. Um, so a royal tutor has been summoned by the king of Grandsreich to tutor is his four youngest sons, so four princes. He's to give them all equal attention to make them fit to be king one day. Uh, but they also have a fifth older brother who is first in line, as well as one sister. Um, so the tutor shows up to the castle, but unfortunately he's stopped by the guards at the entrance because he appears to be a young boy. He's very small and kind of chibi. Um, but luckily for him, the queen mother is there and she recognizes him and brings him inside. Uh, we learn his name is Heine Wittgenstein. Uh, so he's introduced to these four princes, uh, Leonhardt, who's kind of an asshole, Licht, who is a flirty young one, uh, Bruno, who is a responsible brainy one who kind of looks at him suspiciously and Kai who is a quiet one who just glares at him the entire time and so all four of these princes are kind of typical Bashonen character designs like either long haired or just very beautiful graceful features uh, and then the princes make it clear to Heine that they don't want nor do they need a tutor and that all of their previous tutors have they've chased out of there for different reasons um but Heine kind of persists in wanting to interview each of them individually, at least before he goes. And so through process of elimination, he gets Leo or Leonhardt on his own and begins the interview. Uh, he finds that Leo is deathly scared of studying and has earned various awards for stamina and physical fitness because he's constantly sprinting away or riding horses away from his tutors because he just does not want to study for exams ever. Um, but in order to get him to take his little pop quiz, Heine finds Leo's diary in his room and starts opening up and reading the embarrassing contents to the out the window of the castle as loud as he can to try and blackmail him. Uh, and so he starts like all and the diary is basically Leo talking about how embarrassed he gets, especially around girls that he can't talk to. So he's still, he's like, stop, stop, stop. Fine. I'll take your quiz. 
And he finally gets actually pretty serious once he starts taking the test, uh, which makes Heine think that he has like some promise. Um, and so he takes the quiz and he's like, fine, here it is. And then Heine is like, okay, thank you. And he continues, he continued reading the diary while he was taking the quiz and found out that uh, Leo was a big fan of Sacher tort, like chocolate cake or sugar cake. And for a minute, uh, I was like, what? No, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not you, Leo. <laughs> Uh, and so Leo kind of gains respect for Heine because of he treated him nicely and he didn't like say anything embarrassing about his diary. Um, and so basically Heine kind of wins him over by sending him a piece of Sacha torts and thanking him for his hard work. And then in episode two, he's going to move on to an interview of Bruno, who's the next brother or the next prince. Um, so that was, that was basically the, the whole first episode in a nutshell. And that's all I've seen so far. Um, in general, this kind of isn't a show that's directed at me. I really don't like the shonen characters unless they have a lot more interesting things about them. These ones seem pretty one note and you can tell like this show is going to be set up in a way where the Royal Tutor kind of finds what's important to each of them and then trains them along the way and, they do cute things and blah, blah, blah. It's just not for me. It's just you see these shows every season and unless there's like something miraculous happening, like a great source material, I'm not going to be interested in it. So let's and, move on to the next show. Yeah. You said it's like just a big bunch of uh, Bishonen characters, which is neither really of our thing. So yeah, yeah. I'll have to go just to not, another, not really interested. another podcast. We'll cover this. <laughs> this <show. laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so... The next show is called Sagrada Reset. It's on Anime Strike, which is Amazon's anime service, which has gotten quite a few shows this season. Um, Japanese uh, title. Pointedly good shows. And last yeah. season they had Scum's Wish, so they're doing something right so far. Yep. So, and yeah, they're making definitely big moves this season. This is one of the first shows they have. Uh, Japanese title is Sagrada Reset. The studio is David Production, who are known for doing like everything JoJo. Um, but this is not Jojo. Mm. Uh, the director mm. is Shinya Kawatsura, who's one of my favorite directors of anime. He's done shows like Kokoro Connect, No Known Biori, and very recently Tanaka Kun is Always Listless, which was like my favorite comedy show of last year. Uh, and I'll just say this is not one of my favorite shows <laughs> so far. Uh, episode one is called Memory in Children, One Third, which is a very weird episode title. And the episode starts off really awkwardly with two guys playing basketball and they seem like they're friends who know each other, but there's some really forced exposition dialogue where like one of the guys literally says to his friend, my name is K Asai. It's like, wouldn't you just say my name is K? Like, or why would you say your full name to your friend? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's like, yeah, by the way, there's an audience listening. So... They're talking about oh gosh these, yeah these girls that they know at school and there's just this really forced exposition where one of them's talking about a girl named uh, Haruki Mizura who is a weird and distant girl that's in their class and he's saying like maybe you should go out with her and then he's like oh, kind of interested in this girl named Sumire Soma who is another friend of hers but uh, Kay got a letter in his shoe locker uh, from Sumire to meet her on the roof of the school the next day. So he's asking for advice from his friend Tomoki. Um, but when he goes up to the roof the next day, he finds that the weird girl, Haruki, is there instead of Sumire. And so for some reason, his first question that he asks, besides why are you here, is what is your favorite food? <laughs> and she has no answer. She's like, I don't know. And then he's like, what is your least favorite food? <laughs> and she doesn't know the answer to that either. What's your favorite food, Become? Oh, God, that's actually really hard. I'm kind of more like this girl than I thought. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, you don't, you don't have like, like it just a go-to just to keep people off your back? Well, literally the first thing that appeared in my mind was spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> there you when go. you ask that question, but I don't think that's my favorite food. I think it's like kind of what I just want right now. <laughs> I always resort to like either tacos or mac and cheese or oh, meat, just meat good. in general. Oh, yeah. Yum, 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 yum. So um, after a couple awkward moments, the girl s sort of is painfully quiet, and then she whispers under her breath, reset. 
And once she says that, uh, Kay is like back at his locker picking up the letter. So he's gone like back in time, it seems. Uh, and so they live in this town called Sakurata, we find out, where half of the people have special abilities. And if they ever leave the town, they end up forgetting about that ability. So if you want to use the ability, you have to stay. Uh, Kay has ability to recall his past with his five senses, which is why he can still remember being up on the roof with Haruki, even though she reset the past so he shouldn't be able to remember. Everybody else has gone back to normal, but he goes and he- Didn't you say Haruki even herself forgets? Yeah, we're going to learn that in a minute. Yeah. So, Kay- okay, I wanna, when you get there, I'm going to point out a big problem. <laughs> yeah, there's there's some issues with this show. So, Kay confronts Sumiri at school, not the other girl, about not showing up on the roof, even though she wrote the letter. And she tells him her plan was to set him up with Haruki because she thinks that they're both really compatible with each other. Um, so, the, he goes back up to the roof uh, and she confronts Haruki and tells her that. She tells him that the reset ability can go back as far as three days uh, and that she doesn't actually rewind time, but she rearranges everything in the present world to its past state. So time keeps moving forward in the real world, but she rearranges everything and people's memories, apparently, to their past state. Um so, but she has three restrictions on her power. She needs to make a save point in, able, in order to use her power. And that save point has to be within the previous 72 hours. So the last three days. Uh, she also can't make a new save point within 24 hours of resetting. So she couldn't just um, make a new save point after learn, learning information and then going back and exploiting that. And finally, resetting also affects her own memory, so she forgets as soon as she resets time. Okay, uh, explain the save point thing. She can only re make a save point when she can only make a save point. Well, she can only she can only reset to a save point that she made within the past three days, and she can't make another save point uh, immediately after resetting. Like within the next 24 hours, she can't make a new save point until a full day later after resetting. Can she keep the same save point? Uh, yes. Yeah. So she can reset multiple times to a, the same save point, I believe. Okay. Well, that's my big problem because if she doesn't have her memories, she should be stuck in a time loop long before then where she did a reset. And basically she just keeps re setting and resetting because she doesn't remember to do anything differently yeah that's what i think too like she should run into a problem and react the exact same way and then reset mm -hmm. and then run into the same into problem the exact, yep she has no new information so how would she react differently it should play out exactly the same yeah it doesn't make any sense to me it's just it's just really dumb so <laughs> then a whole bunch of so also I, i'm failing to mention that like the character dialogue in this episode like i said in the first scene was very forced exposition but these characters now act and speak to each other kind of like robots do and there's a scene on the roof where Sumire and Haruki and Kei are all talking to each other and they're like we should find out which of us is the most like an android this summer which is <laughs> I don't even understand what that like is that supposed to hint that one of them is like actually an android or that all of them are androids? I think that's what they're trying to hint at. That's just bad writing, dude. Um, but it kind of comes into focus a little bit when Haruki is outside of school and a little girl runs up to her whose name is Amari Kurokawa. And she's upset because she's lost her mom and she can't find out where she needs to go. So Mari, or sorry, Haruki takes uh, care of Mari and like calls Sumire and Sumire is able to find the mom and they meet back up. And like when, when, when the mom takes Mari, she kind of doesn't even look like relieved. She kind of just looks like, I don't know, like burdened, like, and not even very happy about finding her daughter. It's kind of strange. Um, uh, in between this scene and the next scene, Kay proposes to Haruki that they can combine their powers. They're going to get... Oh. 
<laughs> you said proposed to him after getting married. <laughs> no, not yet. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, because if K is able to remember and Haruki is able to reset, he could tell her what happened before the reset. And or then, he could abuse this power. Exactly. Haruki refuses because she says she realizes that K could just lie to her and then exploit the power of resetting because she doesn't retain her memories. Correct. Um, in a later scene in the episode... You got that thing right somehow. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Haruki is sitting with the little girl Mari again. They see, see each other again, and they're in a park. And Mari is telling her that her mother doesn't love her because she's a fake. Uh, and Haruki tells Kay that she wants an to help android? her. android? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, is that she's an android. So Sumiri introduces them to the student council president, who has a power that allows him to copy abilities from one person to another. So he copies Kay's memory ability to Haruki by like holding hands with both of them so that she can remember, she wants to remember something in her past. And she asks to remember being five years old. So Kay kind of thinks back to the time when she was five years old because she's connected to her memory. It's kind of weird. And then so she remembers herself being paralyzed by sadness as a kid. And she describes it as having felt the entire world's sadness around her as if it was her own for some weird reason. Uh, and so she was like crippling with depression, basically crippled with depression. And then at the very end of the episode, Kay tells the little girl, Mari, that the real girl with her name died seven years ago. And asks her dun, who, dun, who she dun. is. So I think we're led to believe that Mari is an android who the mother has purchased to replace her daughter who died seven years ago. But then somehow regrets it because she doesn't like it anymore because she knows it's an android. That I doesn't think doesn't make any sense. It's probably because like, yeah, she knows it's an android. She knows it's not her real daughter. So she's just upset by it, even though she she felt, felt that she needed it, I'm guessing. But yeah, this... God, there was so much complete bullshit, and it was hard to make it through this episode. It was very Ouch. slow. Everybody speaks in a very monotone voice and very robotically, uh, which I think is probably playing into the themes of the show, but it's also just really, really hard to watch. Um, and I'm like, I'm sure that there will be people who will be watching this show and declaring it as like the most deep and most thoughtful anime of the season. Oh but, no, not thoughtful. Come on. Mario <laughs> poking holes in it. <laughs> exactly. I mean like, God, there's just so much that you have to do a lot in the first episode of anime to hook viewers. And this doesn't do much of that. It presents a mystery kind of, but it's not a mystery I really care about. And there's going to be 24 episodes of this show. And I don't know if I could sit through 24 more minutes. <laughs> so yeah, that's Sagrada reset. Uh, let's move on to Wednesdays and Sakura Quest. Yay. Uh, do you want to take the first part or the second part of this one? Uh, I wrote a synopsis for a second part, so you take the first. Okay, cool. So Sakura Quest is on Crunchyroll. The studio is PA Works. Uh, the director is Soichi Masui, who's done Chaika the Coffin Princess and recently the uh, Final Fantasy XV Brotherhood anime. Uh, so episode one, off to Magical Maniyama. So our main character is a pink haired girl named Yoshino Koharu, who has, I think, graduated college. She's like, in, she's like 20 years old, I think, which is rare for anime to be about 20 year old girls who are actually out of college. But she's trying. No kidding. Yeah, she's trying very hard to make it in Tokyo. She's trying so hard that she's applied to 31 separate jobs and gotten turned <laughs> down from all of them. And she's starting to run out of money. So. One day she gets a call from uh, a modeling agency called Momanga Production, and they have a job for her. And it's to go to this rural town uh, that has requested her by name specifically to become their queen mascot. Uh, so she travels to this rural town called Manoyama. And when she arrives, there's like people standing at the train station that have a little banner out for her. Except there was a mistake. Apparently, they requested a girl named Yoshino Subaki, not Yoshino Koharu. And apparently, the kanji are like almost exactly the same. So it's an easy mistake to make. Yoshino Subaki was a pop star who this old guy named Karuta in the town loved. 
but he didn't realize that she already died eight years ago. So it's like this pop star who he loved growing up and he was going to invite her back to the town to like bring the town back to like, you know, being it was famous. his pop star crush. Exactly. <laughs> so Ushimatsu Karuta, this guy, he's the king of this town. Uh, and he decides to accept Koharu to be the new queen, even though it was just a twist of fate that she ended up there. Um, and so she's going to be crowned the queen of what they call the independent state of Chupacabra, which is what they call their tourist town project. That is like a relic of some old national funding program to raise awareness of like rural towns in Japan. Uh, and so Chupacabra is obviously a play on the words, well, Chupacabra, which is like the, the magical like monster. And then Kabu which is the Japanese word for turnip because their town's Wait, magical monster. I think it's just like a weird monster hybrid thing. Uh, yeah, Mexican. I don't know. Look, I think I it's from know. Mexico. I don't know about Chupacabra lore, Leo. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, there's a girl in this show who knows all about Chupacabra lore. So. All right, please explain. So, uh, yeah, so like it's a mix of the Chupacabra and Kabu So because it's like an agricultural town. It's like a weird little play on words. So anyway, Koharu... Uh, makes friends with a young woman named Shiori, uh, who she first meets when she gets there. Uh, and she starts calling um, Koharu by the name Yoshi. So I'll call her Yoshi from now on. So um, she's a country girl as well, but she moved to Tokyo because she didn't, didn't want to spend the rest of her life living out in the sticks. Like So that's why she tried to get 31 jobs and failed. But uh she gets set up in this log cabin place that used to be a dorm and meets another girl there. And it's one that she had seen briefly on the train on the way in. Um, and she also finds out to her dismay that the contract that she signed uh, to be the queen of this town was for one year of work, not one day. So now she's like frantically freaking out because she doesn't want to be trapped in the country for a year. Like she calls her agent and they're like, did you even read the contract? It's right there. <laughs> so she like runs to the train station. Uh, she's trying to like catch the last train out of town. Uh, and she like sees a bus on her way there and she gets on the bus. And the only guy on the bus besides the driver is this weird blonde dude who's like strumming a ukulele and, <laughs> and like singing weird like songs. He's talking about the nose if the bus had nose hairs, how would it sense things? It's weird. It's really weird. It it's made no weird sense. <laughs> um, so she gets off the bus and the bus driver calls Karuta, the king of the town, tells him that the queen is trying to run away. And so he d devises a plan with Shiori. Uh, so he dresses up in the Chupacabra outfit. And Shiori, like, pretends to be a damsel in distress, telling Koharu, like, hey, there's a sword right there in the stone. If you take the sword out of the stone and you defeat the Chupacabra, you can save me. They're trying to make her feel like a hero. But basically, she sees right through them. She walks up to the Chupacabra guy takes her purse and like hits him over the head with it, knocking him down. Uh, so, and she's like really sorry about that afterwards, but she's just really pissed at the whole situation. Um, but at the end of the episode, Yoshi makes her way back to the place where she's staying, uh, but it's locked. So she instead goes to the community center or something like that to spend the night there. And she finds a bulletin board with pictures of the town. And she sees one picture in particular that kind of blows her mind. It's her. She sees herself on a little throne as a little girl uh, wearing a queen's hat and all the regalia. And she had had a flashback from the beginning of the episode. She'd always thought she was special or was meant to be a queen. And she realizes that it's because of this little moment that she had as a little girl in this town where she had dressed up as a queen. She, she always wanted to get back to that point. Uh, so in the end, despite all of her protests, it looks like she's going to have to give this gig one more shot. Uh, and that's where episode one ends. If you want to take episode two. All right. Uh, picking up right from there. Episode two, it starts off with um, Kadota. Is that his name? That's how I say it, right? Yeah, Kadota, Kadota, yeah. Kadota. He accidentally ordered a thousand boxes of manju instead of the 100 boxes he initially thought. Uh, Yoshino still wants to go back to Tokyo, but Kadota strikes a deal with her that if she can sell all the boxes within one week, 
he will forget about the year-long contract. Uh, Yoshino, that, I mean, this is her best way out, so she accepts. Uh, basically, this whole episode is about being introduced to the other girls, considering this episode was called The Gathering of Five Champions. Uh, we immediately get introduced to Ririko, who is supposed to be uh, very shy. Uh, she gives Yoshiro the idea to make a new website for the town to help sell the manju, which leads to the need of a web designer. Fortunately, one moved in in last year, and it turns out her name is Sane, and she's definitely afraid of bugs. It's a really <laughs> cute scene where like they go to her house and are knocking on the door, and she's not answering because she's on the computer. And did she have headphones on? Uh, yeah, she had headphones on. She yeah, was so like, she didn't hear them knocking, and then like some like bug crawls up next to her. She's writing a, a uh, she's on a blog writing about. Being in the countryside and listening to the insects and stuff like that. And like some bug crawls next to her and she screams deathly. And like <laughs> the the uh, two outside go running inside to uh, be like, what's wrong? And they talk to her and eventually convince her to uh, help out. And she's probably the hottest one. I'm just going to put that out there. It's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you always got to pick one that's the hottest, especially if we're going to talk about a show where they pre- present all the girls well of age. <laughs> this is true. Heaven forbid. <laughs> so Yoshino wants an online store to sell the manju. Uh, Sane says it would take probably a month to set up an online store, but suggests that they advertise it as you can only get this manju by coming all the way out to their town, thus sounding, you know, more rare in the process. <laughs> uh, Q scene. Did I skip something? No. No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, we, cue the scene of making a website and getting pictures for it. Uh, oh, there's a little part where they're making the website and they're like, what should we call Yoshino? The, should we call her the beautiful queen? And Yoshino's like, eh, that seems like a little too forward. And they're like, well, what if we put an asterisk next to beautiful? And they're like, or maybe a question mark, like the beautiful queen? And then they're like, <laughs> they finally decide on the beautiful quote based strictly on individual opinion queen <laughs> i just like that. Uh, was it this episode or the last episode where they showed up and they found out that the uh, blue hair girl that was staying in the uh uh maki yeah i think they well they they saw her last episode but then all of the girls showed up and talked to her in this episode i think i think when you moved my uh notes you skipped out a part cuz i remember writing it and reading it last time. Oh, oh well, that's too bad. Oh well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, cute scene of making the the website and get pictures for it. They're just having no luck selling the manju. So to sell the manju, they decide to make a video. It's very crappy and generic, and it's hilarious. But it's like the queen saving innocent civilians from the chupacabra. Um, they still don't make the deadline before the manju, and then they're sitting around on a table and. They kind of make a deal with Yoshiro that she at least has to stay around to uh, watch the cherry blossoms because it's like the most beautiful thing out there right now. And she's like, all right, but that's like in their two weeks out. So she's basically decided to stay there for another two weeks, regardless of her contract. And that's the end of the second episode. And I'm sorry for butchering that, not being prepared. Oh, don't sorry, worry about listeners. it. Yeah, at some point during the episode. I'm not apologizing to you. <laughs> listeners, I don't give a crap about you. That's Anyways. True. <laughs> um, the glasses girl, Sane, like at oh, some I point. I love you. Oh, thank you. I know. Fuck you. And then uh, <laughs> Sane <laughs> pushes her. Like she pushes Yoshino, basically asking her like, what opportunities are you even talking about in Tokyo? Because Yoshino was mm. saying like, yeah, you can do anything you want in Tokyo. And she's just saying, like, you know, I moved out to the country because, like, I didn't need to be in Tokyo anymore. You can find work just fine outside the city with an internet job. So that that, that was an interesting scene. I, I just basically feel like this show has a dynamic that's very similar to something like Shiro Bako, where five girls were working together uh, to create something great. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention the ED, which is really catchy, and I like find myself snapping my fingers to it every time it comes on. <laughs> it's really good. I really like this show so far. I love that the girls are not 
13 years old. That's amazing. Thank you, anime. That <laughs> Dude, that sold it so quickly for me when they're like, the first thing they do in episode one is like, she's 20 years old and out of college. I was just like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, God. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and the, I just love PA Works character designs. Like you said, the glasses girl is really cute. I think all of the girls are really cute. I really like Yoshi. Oh, and believe me, they're all contenders. Like they make glasses girl work for her. My, her top position in my poll just saying oh yeah so let's move, move on to the next show which uh i'll get through really quickly because i literally just watched this out of just blatant curiosity roommates on crunchyroll <laughs> the studio is typhoon graphics the director is takashi sakuma who directed one room uh or he was the episode director on one room i don't i guess he's not the, the he wasn't the lead director sure it's not in night Shyamalan directing this i'm pretty sure unfortunately and neither was the first season we had hoped for an <laughs> m night Shyamalan twist to one room but what a twist <laughs> it would have been so good i would have had to watch it <laughs> uh episode one is called the roommates welcome you so roommate is the the male version of the female one room so basically this is directed at girls rather like fan service for girls whereas one room was total blatant fan service for guys so it's kind of fascinating because i wanted to see how the creators of one room pandered to this female audience instead of a male one and what the differences were so like if you remember one room it was a bunch of lolly girls who came and like lived with this guy or like dated this guy slash sisters yeah <laughs> slash sisters yes um so the main difference with this is that the guys were older at least in appearance um there's no like shodas in this group they're all like teenage guys or at least in appearance or maybe even older they're introduced in a group of three so not one by one with like three episode arcs and they're also just constantly the fan service is like they're constantly either not wearing a shirt or that's basically it. Like in the ED, there's like the ED, the ED is really funny. There's this like part where like they're all sitting together, the three guys, and their shirts just like dis uh, dissipate away until they're all just abs. <laughs> it's just it's so ugly looking, but it's like it's just so blatant. So it's really funny to watch this just because it's like so. This is what the anime industry thinks trashy fan service is that works on girls rather than what works on guys. So it's just, just really interesting from that point of view. It's not interesting from any other point of view. And we really so need terrible. a female guest to come on every once in a while. Yeah, we should see, like we should ask them like, hey, does this like, does this do it for you? Like, I really don't think it would though. Like this was so bad. Yeah, like something to look into a uh, future episodes. Yeah, just go watch Free or Haikyuu instead. <laughs> You'll have such a better time. All right. Uh, so let's let's move to the, on. Yeah, yep. your favorite show. Just go. Now, is it your favorite show? We'll find out. Now, I thought this was your favorite show because I looked at your notes for episode three and I oh, saw that good. you're loving it. I'm so glad that you saw my <laughs> my glowing <laughs> notes on episode three. Which and we'll get without to. getting into it, I will say the thing you hate about her hair is one of the things I love. Oh so. God, damn it! That, <laughs> look forward to a podcast later about two discussion. Weeks from now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Buso Shoju Machiavellianism, also uh, English title Armed Girls Machiavellianism, Studio Silverlink, and director Tachi Bana Hideki. Uh, he's was an assistant director on a certain magical index, and there was absolutely nothing else to note that I could find. So. Okay. Uh, we start off with what I'm assuming is a student council, soon to be corrected, uh, where all the girls are armed with weapons. Uh, they're talking about a new transfer student who got kicked out of his school for being in a brawl involving 40 people. In the end, he happened to be the one most injured, but it was all 40 like versus him. His name is Fudo Nomura. Uh, the girls having the discussion are a lolly with a pet bear named Hanasaka Warabi. That's your favorite, right? So far. Please just get through this as fast as possible. <laughs> oh God, you're ready to end this. Uh, a sleepy Inaba Sukuyo. It's killing me, dude. A prim prim proper Kika Kyojo Mary. Who has drill hair, which I hate. Go on. I like drill hair. <laughs> a flat out weird Tamaba Satori. Green hair girl. And a girl with a demon mask. Oni Gawara Rim. Get it, Oni. 
mm-hmm. demon to him. Hmm. And finally, who I thought their time was their leader, uh, Amo Kiru Kiru. So who has uh, yeah, you finish first, and I'll say something. <laughs> and who has apparently fought Nomaru before and warns Rin to watch out for her spirits bolts. And turns out she was also another transfer in delinquent who happened to defeat all five of them. So uh, the only thing I wanted to mention is that the way that the characters are introduced with like loud sound effects and then like with big font behind them kind of reminded me a little bit of kill the kill and then one of the characters was named kiru kiru which is literally like kiru la kiru uh so i thought there was a kill the kill connection but the more i'm watching the show the less i kind of see that going on. yeah i think that's more or less a coincidence at this point yeah yeah uh we get the intro and then immediately we see nomura our delinquent is immediately held at play point when he shows up to class by uh Ren, the Oni girl, and the other girls in the class. Uh, it turns out the school used to be an all girl school that went co ed, but the girls were scared and were armed to the and now they're armed to to the teeth to help protect themselves. Uh, but since then, there's been a top five girls in the school to control the balance. They are called the Five Swords, as were the girls we were introduced to at the very beginning. Other schools send their delin- delinquents to this school because they basically get beaten into being reformed which is basically they wear makeup and act like girls and be total weirdos it's a little messed up that like the way that they're (laughs) reformed is into cross-dressing so it's like a punishment for them to look girly i guess i don't know it's kind of misogynist i don't know whatever (laughs) it's this is a this this show to me is a very turn your brain off just enjoy the goofiness i like the characters and all that fun stuff even like the fan service which is there is some but unlike some of the other shows this season, it's kept in check to an extent. It, ha- it has a leash on it. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> it has a leash. They, the owner can let you get close, but they'll pull it back. Unlike your bastard show where like the, the leash keeps breaking. Oh, yeah. That was just horrible. <laughs> yeah. This is more lighthearted <laughs> fan service for sure. So Nomura is given two options by uh, Rin, who... Uh, it's either leave or coexist. So that means dressing up. Uh, he refuses both and then moves so quickly, nobody can even see him. Uh, right through one of the other girl's legs towards a window. The girls are like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like generic stuff, but I think it's, I don't know. They just kind of tweaked it a little bit to make it funny again. Mm-hmm. And then right before he jumps out the window, he says purple, which is the girl's uh color underwear and the girls are like yeah again and like there's like this side background commentary or like somebody's like oh my so bold <laughs> so i like i like this guy's character he's like i ain't gonna take shit from nobody i want a little fun while i'm doing it <laughs> so ren and nomura are fighting out on the school rounds it's mostly just technique blabber and fighting blah 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 nomura has to eventually pull out his weapon which is a turns out to be a blade resistant type glove because uh ren is using a big ass sword uh, Nomura finally gets past Ren's onslaught and gently rests his hands on her side and Ren is under assumption she has the upper, upper hand and tells him to give up but Nomura says she should, she, she should give up because he has a gun and she only has a sword Indiana and then, Jones reference yeah <laughs> and then he's just like boom and she goes flying away um, <laughs> then man, man this next part Nomura has Ren pinned down is on all fours over the top of her so you immediately know what to see I'm talking about and she had mentioned something about knowing the name of his technique and he's like why how, Why and how do you know the name of my technique which that one girl from earlier had said and he's getting like really close to her face with his face oh yeah like I said he's on all fours over the top of her I mean everybody knows what picture I'm painting here if you watch anime especially if you listen to an anime podcast <laughs> <laughs> So then some pink hair girl comes running up and hits him in the back of the head, making his head go down and kiss Ren, obviously. And half her mask breaks off. <laughs> in the episode. Uh, you got anything you want to add? Uh, not until the end of episode two. If, do you want to keep going uh, with this synopsis mm-hmm. or should I take it? You go then. Yeah. Unless you want to try to read my... Uh, I can, and then you can comment. Yeah, just give you a break. So episode two starts off with uh, Mary Kikakujo's younger sister, whose name is like Choka, or and it's like C. Cho- it's a, she has like a really, really ridiculously long name, but let's just call her Choka. She also has yeah, but 
<laughs> they call her Choka, but she has a bigger name, which she keeps trying to proclaim on. She's but. also a drill-haired lolly, which is like <laughs> my ho- most hated character design ever. I now know your weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> God, this is this is unfortunate. <laughs> you know my hey, dark Mary secret. Hey, Mary way the more makes up for it. She is a very voluptuous drill-haired girl. This is true. God. I'll admit it. Then she uh, Why do you hate drill hair because it's like <laughs> they're always the prim and proper types. Yeah, it's just like it's such a weird trope, and I feel like it's. Um, and they've seen this character design so many times before. Like, do something else interesting. But uh, so she's uh, closest to the five swords, and she will get revenge for Rin for being held down by Nomura and having her precious lips stolen from her. Uh, and she so, proclaims, yeah, she proclaims <laughs> this. Uh, Nomura's goal, on the other hand, is just to leave campus. He wants to be able to leave. But to do that, he needs to get a permission slip with a stamp from each of the five swords, the five blades. Uh, So Nomura finds out that uh, he can get things smuggled into school for the right price. So he gets a cake uh, and goes to class the next day uh, to try to appease the girls and get his permission slip signed. Uh, But he notices Rin isn't there. And uh, he asks one of the girls in the classroom, hey, Purple, he's still calling her by the color of her <laughs> panties, where's Rin? And, Re- recurring joke, love it. Yeah, and she's like, don't call me by the color of my panties, damn it. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. He's like, he just doesn't give a shit. So all of his jokes kind of come off like funny, funnier than if he was like really insistent about something. Or Yeah, you know. exactly. So another girl steps up um, next to him with blue hair and tells him that uh, Rin is resting and sick from the shock uh, of being kissed the other day. And Nomura asked asked this girl, like, where's Rin and what color are her panties? Like, he just slipped that in her. And so the girl's like, oh, also her panties are white, I think. (laughs) Like, the other girl's (laughs) like, don't tell him that. God damn it. So uh, he goes and uh, goes to Rin's uh, room. Uh, Rin is like kind of like recovering from the battle the day before. She has a fever. Yeah, she's laying in bed and she's like thinking about being kissed by Nomura. And she's like, that son of a bitch. But then she's also like, but it was my first kiss. So she's like falling for him while being really pissed at him because she's a little teenage girl. And so <laughs> he com- he gets to the room. Love is so confusing when you're so young, be calm. Don't you know this? Well, I would think that, you know, being sexually assaulted wouldn't lead to romance, but that's just, you know, me. Uh, so <laughs> so anyway, uh, he appears, like, in the window of her room, like, behind her. Like, she had readied her sword and was looking at the door, and he gets in the room behind her and starts talking to her and chatting her up and being really nice. Um, and uh, eventually she starts to pass out from like him getting like too close to her and stuff and saying suggestive things yeah, saying suggestive things and like she she like uh cat he catches her by the collar before she hits the ground which of course like pops the top button of her shirt off and then reveals like the cleavage in her bra and just at that moment uh the pink haired girl i forget what her name is walks by in the hallway it hasn't given it to us yet yeah she opens the door and she sees this scene of course, she hits like an emergency button on the wall that causes the entire dorm to go in lockdown. And like, so Nomura starts running away and then there's like spike traps and all this shit and blaring. There's alarms. even a boulder. So another like Indiana Jones scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this whole school is set up to kill delinquents if this kind of thing happens. Um, so he escapes, but he runs into Choka. And so now he's in a fight with Choka and the pink haired girl whose name is Nono. That's her name. Um, yeah. So Nomura like easily gets them tangled up together by just like sidestepping them. So they both sort of attack each other. And so like Because Choka uses a whip. Yeah. So she like uses her whip, but it ties up Nona and Nono and her together. And so they're on the ground and the whip is like riding up like the lolly girl's <laughs> butt crack. <laughs> it's like such a fan service shot. It's kind of funny though. Uh, but I was like, yeah, and like like Leo says here, like, this is a show you expect fan service from, so it's kind of, like, a little bit forgivable uh, yeah. because of that. Or it's like, you know, you're here for this, like, stupid stuff anyway, so. Um, 
both looks like Nomura proclaims he's going to beat some respect into their elders from them. Uh, and so both girls get like really scared and start crying. And then he panics and doesn't know what to do. Uh, and after that point, we switch scenes and we get like a kind of sexy shower scene with Mary proclaiming she will get revenge on Nomura for pu- putting his hands on her cute little sister, Choka. Exceedingly cute little sister. Like she like <laughs> stresses this. I love it. Well, you see, she has drill lolly hair, so she's actually not cute. You see, this is how that works. <laughs> Dr- drill hair is cute, dude. No, it's not. I hate it. I hated it in ReZero, too. Uh, due, <laughs> due to his last battle, the mis- misunderstanding. Um, yeah, so everybody is against Nomura. And Rin says she will be supervising him from now on because she's, like, falling for him. Uh, and honestly... Yeah, that's my, this is mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then you, honestly, you I believe this is a good show. It doesn't take itself seriously. It does take lots of old gags and stuff that have been done, but just tweaks them, I guess, updates them. Yeah. And like I said, I could just turn my brain off and watch it and enjoy it. And I, I think the characters are rather unique and interesting in their own way. I would actually go as far as to say the characters are actually too good for what they're doing in this show. Yeah, and I just didn't I didn't love the characters, though I've watched a little bit further now and I, I see what you're talking about. They yeah, they are like fairly well defined, but a lot they're of them update, are just tropes. Updated generic versions yeah. to me is what it is. Yeah, they're they're updated tropes characters, yeah. But I the main character kind of ties it all together by just being like such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And it's different from the way that uh Akashic Bastard Professor did it. Like he's not that far of an asshole. He's just like Mm-mm. a kind of likable asshole. So yeah. Now, as far as I can tell, this uh character has not made a rape joke yet no not yet he's just beating girls into submission to love him yeah it seems like <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> when you say it that way <laughs> it's kind of bad <laughs> but uh i guess it's portrayed in a way that's slightly less dark so yeah I'll, I'll give it a little pass so um i think that brings us to the end of what is going to be the first part of our first impressions podcast so uh, if you come back in a few days, we will have the rest of our impressions and then also the final vote to decide which shows we're going to watch in the spring season. Anything else to add, yes. Leo? Uh, no, it's just a very unique voting process. I'm excited for it. I think it'll be pretty good and really good for this podcast. Yeah. So uh, join us next time when we find out if this season can get any worse. <laughs> oh, gosh. All See I'll say, like, well, all I'll say, Leo, before we leave, <laughs> is all girls my age love dicks. <sighs> Anyways, in this podcast now. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.